Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is how to compose a thesis statement. So this is about, to some degree, thinking about your um, ideas. There's still some just like, on some level that pre-writing stage is like staring and thinking. It's Discussing, maybe sometimes it's like making the like mind map or the brainstorming sheet that I'm sure teachers taught you in middle school. Um, everybody's going to have a different way of coming up with their ideas. But the next step is putting it into some form that makes sense as a thesis statement. Okay? My job here and my goal. is to teach you how to write the right kind of thesis statement for this type of paper. Basically, most writing contains a thesis statement of some sort, um, and I'm sure you already know how to write them, but I need you to learn how to write one for this type of literature essay. Um, you have to have a good thesis to have a good paper. There's basically no way around that. You're not going to be able to do all the other things on the rubric if you don't have something good to start with. Okay, you could follow a recipe perfectly and, and if it just, you know, is something that tastes bad in the first place. This metaphor, I'm stretching it, but what are you going to do? Um, so, I wish this
idea that you have to sort of go back and forth between the two, but that in concept, you can either go from, I noticed these techniques, I'm gonna close read them and find meaning, or you can say, I have an idea about the book, I'm gonna go find portions of the text that will help me prove my idea. Realistically, because it's back and forth, you're gonna use both methods. I just want you to think about the way you're thinking. Very IB again. So, I have a whole sheet of questions you can ask yourself about the text. Um, these are good, I would hang on to this for basically the rest of your life, because you know it's that brilliant of a handout. Um, things that for any text you can ask yourself, how does this structurally create meaning? Um, are there motifs or symbols that are repeated? What do they mean? What does the title mean? Um, is there anything conspicuous about this particular author's style? For example, we're gonna later read an essay by David Foster Wallace, and that man uses so many footnotes to just like sort of have an aside, almost like it's a little play, and he's like, fun fact, and says a little footnote. It's, it's a very weird style, and it contributes a lot to the meaning of the text and how we get meaning from his text, so that would be notable. How does the author want me to feel about the characters? We don't always have to like both characters for it to be a good book. Are we supposed to really hate a particular character? And if so, how is the author communicating that this character is not a great guy? Um, how is the story narrated? Who's rewarded or punished in the story? Um, I think this is a really good point whenever books are controversial. Because if you think about um, a story's theme, it really depends on the ending. Okay, so if you tell two stories and the front end of the stories is the same, um, a girl wants to go out to a party, meet a boy, she's nervous, she decides to drink to take um, you know, her, her nerves away, and then from there, the stories diverge. In story A, she drinks, she flirts with the guy even though she was scared. He says, oh my gosh, I like you too, and they kiss and it's beautiful and everybody's happy. That sends one message about drinking, right? If in story B, she drinks at the party, can't handle her liquor, throws up, embarrasses herself in front of everybody, and crashes the car on the way home and like paralyzes her friend that sends a very different message about drinking, right? So like the same events happened in the story in terms of like the, the drinking existed, but because she was rewarded for it in the first story and punished for it in, a, in the second story, we end up with two very different thematic statements. So that's something you always wanna look at, is Holden, for example, being rewarded for the choices he makes or is the story punishing him for the choices he makes? Um, allusions to history and literature. Are we finding common symbols? You know, the apple, the, um, I don't know, I don't know what I'm looking for. I read a fun one the other day. It was a Japanese story and there was a sort of side allusion to a particular type of fox and I didn't fully get it. Um, but in Japanese folklore and literature, this particular, I think Kitsun, um, this particular fox is thought to be a shapeshifter, and frequently beautiful women are secretly these like winter foxes, and like if they get wet, like their tail is revealed, and all this stuff like that, and that really lends a lot of meaning to the story because that was a symbol that within that readership, everyone would have been like, oh, of course that fox is a woman. Um, does that make sense? That sort of shared collective knowledge? Um, you wanna look at how it matches different conventions. So if we've got a fairy tale and it follows the conventions of a fairy tale, cool, that's sort of boring. But if it's breaking a convention, why is it breaking that convention? Okay, so like when we see modernized Cinderella stories, it's frequently like, and then Cinderella, you know, broke the glass heel and kicked the guy to the curb 
stores and started her own small business. And it's usually like the whole point is to make a story about like the problems inherent in the fairy tale story structure. So that's more interesting than just like, hey, look, it's a fairy tale. Uh, usually differences are always more interesting than um, something following what you expect. Questions so far? Okay. The last page is less about your ideas and more about actually writing the thesis statement. So there's a few formulas. You do not have to follow these formulas and there's many thesis statements that will not follow these formulas that will be very good. But in case you're struggling, um, the first one is it may seem like X, but actually Y. And that sort of plays with that idea that this is the way everybody reads the text, but look, I think you should look at it differently. Interesting, right, requires proving. It may seem like Romeo and Juliet are in love, but actually Romeo is a player and Juliet would have realized eventually had she not died. Um, while some Christians believe that Harry Potter is about witchcraft, the novels strongly support Christian morality and have Christian imagery and themes. Uh, example two, once you understand X, you can see that Y. So that's sort of um, a, a linear-ish argument where you say, First, I'm gonna explain this one thing, and now that you know that, that leads me to my sort of second related point. You're sort of developing multiple <clears throat> ideas that are connected. Seeing Harry and Voldemort as foil characters enhances the theme of the series that choice dictates character. So, um, first you would establish that these two characters are foil characters, but that's not enough you then connect it with a so what, like why does that matter? Because now I understand the theme better and how that character relationship enhances the theme. Um, and then finally, author uses blank to show that blank. And sometimes when you're really focused in on a particular literary device, this is the one you might use. Um, Rowling uses Phoenix imagery to distinguish Harry's rebirth from Voldemort's. Um, so, you know, Voldemort's always getting reborn. He's like the guy with backwards hair and the turban and all that jazz, right? And he's got, he's that like horrible little homunculus in the one movie. Um, whereas the Phoenix imagery, uh, you know, the Order of the Phoenix, all that, that's about like a good rebirth rising from the ashes, things like that. And of course, Harry dies, but he doesn't really, because he's a horcrux and all that. I'm, I'm really just loosening it here. But um, the point is, you take one specific symbol and close read the heck out of it to arrive at some more complex understanding of the text. Notice that all of these end up with your reader understanding the book in a new, different, interesting way. You have to go beyond what an average reader of the text would understand just from reading the book. You can't write a thesis, hold and hates phonies, because we all know that, okay? I don't expect you to be like the next most brilliant literary critic in the world, but you have to stretch a little bit beyond what we get from just reading the text. Questions, comments, anything? Okay.